Yeah, but it depends if you're in El Salvador, which I imagine it's uh, a lot earlier. But before I actually begin with the topic, let's see. I don't know if all of you know, but um, so so in, in, in Save the Med, we do uh, expeditions, which are usually around spring or summertime. And we usually do them on this ship. Let's see. There we go. I'm going to be using my phone a little bit for images. So that ship is called uh, Toftabag. It's about 110 years old. Um, and it's uh, used to fish, um, I think, herring in the North Sea. And it's uh, a Norwegian ship. But uh, our captain and uh, our head researcher, Ricardo Sagarminaga, um, he got it, uh, I think he's had it for like 30 years and been using it as a research vessel. So we do um, expeditions, uh, which this year they're going to be nine days. And and we, we basically, uh, everyone lives on the ship together, um, crew, and uh, volunteers, and uh, we go out into the Mediterranean Sea, and um, anything that we that we find, uh, whales, dolphins, turtles. Uh, we even monitor human activities. We do research on uh, microplastics and pollution. Uh, so we're out there basically uh, working from literally from sunrise to sunset, and uh, trying to do as much as we can during the season. And that research uh, really contributes to. Uh, to local marine protected areas, um, obviously general knowledge about the condition of the oceans, and a lot more. So um, these uh, these little little lessons, um, there are different small aspects of uh, the work that Save the Med does, and well, I'm speaking about the expeditions more because that's what uh, I'm more more a part of. But Save the Med, they also have different projects. Uh, there was a talk on Posidonia, for example, which is a a protected seagrass, a very important habitat here in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, there have been talks about uh, sharks, which are really, really cool. Um, there's been talk about uh, microplastics, sea turtles, a lot of things. So, uh, And this is the, the talk on, on dolphins. Uh, let's see, anyone else? Luca, hello, Luca. Buenas tardes. Mm -hmm. And yes, I think that puts probably Brad or someone on there. Yeah, if you have any questions, um, I'll kind of be uh, I'll be keeping an eye on on this side of the screen, um, but uh, I may I may select uh, a few um, to interrupt myself with at the moment if they're relevant. But uh, if um, if they're a bit off topic uh, off topic and stuff, I'll I'll deal with them afterwards. So, anyways, um, let's get down to it. Dolphins. So let's see, whales and dolphins. Well, let's forget the seals. We're not going to talk about them. Whales and dolphins. Um, are called cetaceans, and I'm not really going to go into into um, their biology too much. I'm going to assume that you more or less know that they're mammals. Um, they live in the oceans, all that kind of thing. I'm going to go more into how uh, do we go out there and how do we get information on them. So, so these animals, they're they're really they their range could be really really uh, big. Um, they live, uh, some of them are coastal, but then some of them are also um, deep sea animals. So a little bit further from the coast and not that easy to get to. And and also they spend about 90% of their time underwater. So they're really challenging animals to to uh, to do research on. So, you know, I, uh, I sometimes uh, find it funny, you know, people that go to, uh, let's say, Africa to study some lions in the savannah. They go in, in, their, in their cars with their air conditioning on probably sometimes. Um, with their cameras, all their gear, and uh, if the lions are just sitting under under a tree, uh, having a nap, and they just sit there and they watch them. But um, any of you who have been at sea and seen whales and dolphins will know that it's uh, not that easy at all. And dolphins don't come up to the ship and just you know breach right next to you all the time. Sometimes they're quite far away, and uh, sometimes if you're not looking, you can you can you can actually miss them depending on the sea conditions. So. Uh, studying whales and dolphins is quite a, a quite an interesting task. Um, one of the one of the first um, ways in which whales and dolphins were were studied uh, was was through animals that arrived um, arrived on the beach. So animals that stranded. So um, I've done a bit of work with strandings as well, just so that you all know. Um, this is a little gory picture here, right? So this is um, a recent stranding of a Cuvier's beaked whale, which is um, an animal that you don't really see too often. And uh, and so, for example, from those kind of um, events, you can get a lot of information on um, age of the animal, uh, cause of death. Uh, you can take tissue samples. Um, a lot of it goes to the lab, of course, to get analyzed, uh, genetics. Uh, with this animal in particular, a Cuvier's beaked whale, which, by the way, 
we we try to um, to uh, to draw it here. I don't know if it's really um, if it's really visible, but anyways, it's uh, it's the um, it's the deepest diving animal in the world. So more than the sperm whale, they can go to over three thousand meters deep to to forage, and so those animals are really really interesting to to study. And in fact, you hardly see them really in in the in in the wild and alive. So uh, all the information you can get from strandings is uh, is super valuable. However, if you want to study um, wild animal populations, so a quick hi, said here, hello, Helena. Ah, cool, some a few newcomers. If you want to study wild populations, you've got to actually go out there. You can't just wait on the shore. Uh, you've got to go on a on a ship. Sometimes uh, some studies use uh, airplanes, but um, don't think our budget is quite there yet. Uh, but yeah, you go out out to sea, and you need uh, you need certain methods. So. So before, um, a lot of scientists used to go out there and they used to be a bit brutal with animals. So they would go up to pods. Uh, they would um, sometimes even be as brutal as uh, cast a net over them. Uh, they would catch some individuals. They would tag them. Sometimes it would be quite invasive on the dorsal fin. Um, and, and of course, the, these kind of um, methods are, can, they, they can be risky for, for researchers, but they're also not really good for the animals at all. Um, Welfare-wise, uh, I, I would not recommend them at all um, uh, today, uh, because we have um, we, we have a lot uh, a lot of new methods. So so one of them is is what I'm going to talk to you about today. So um, so it's so it's really useful uh, just for studying uh, wild dolphins. It's really useful uh, apart from when you sight them, you see what species it is, uh, you see uh, where they are, so you get GPS coordinates. Um, activity. So, what are they doing? Are they feeding, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera, all these things. But if you really want to go more in depth, and this is what we're going to talk about today, you need um, to be able to recognize different individuals. So, you need to be able to say, "Hey, you know, that guy is." Uh, I'm going to choose your names. That guy is Luca over there, and that one is uh, Helena over there, and that one is Sergio, and that one is Brad, and he's the leader of the pod, <laughs> and. Um, and all and all these different things, right? So 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 that gives you a really big, uh, really nice insight into into more of the um, more of their daily lives, let's say. And that has a lot of um, applications to conservation. So um, instead of giving you uh, a lecture here, just being very stationary, I'm going to invite a volunteer to help. And so so the way that we we go about um, studying. Uh, individual animals is that you need um, because they don't have IDs, right? They don't have IDs. They don't come up to the boat. They don't uh, register and say, "Hey, this is my passport. Um, I'm such and such." None of that. So you need to find a way of doing it. You need to find a way of doing it without touching the animals, without killing any animals. Um, and, um, and to be honest, the most ideal situation of, of all is that the animals hardly know that you're there, right? So you don't want to disturb their natural activity. And the way that uh, that, well, there was a researcher from British Columbia called Mike Big, and he realized that the dorsal fin, in his case of killer whales, but it, it's valid for all dolphin species, the dorsal fin of each individual is uh, unique. So each dorsal fin will have a slightly different shape, uh, even different size, and they'll have uh, different little nicks and not uh, a, lot of, a lot of different things. So if you take a photograph of um, of a dorsal fin, and it's clear enough. Then, in the future, when you recite the same animal, you'll be able to uh, recognize it. So that that is that is the basics of, of photo ID. So um, when you see biologists out at sea uh, taking photographs of dolphins, um, we are <laughs> taking photographs of dolphins jumping and um, and enjoying it a lot, of course. But uh, another thing that we're doing is trying to take photographs of um, the dorsal fins of the dolphins because this is the dolphin's um, ID card. So ideally, we would get both sides. We would get, this would be the right side. Yep, the right side and, and there we go. So, let's see where did I put this, okay. So you may get, uh, you may end up with different, I've called one Judith and I've called one Ignacio. So um, if you get clear enough photographs, you will have very clear uh, dorsal fins of the animals and you can 
tell one from, from the other, right? So this is just to give an idea. The idea as well, we do it um, obviously digitally now because we have awesome computers and awesome cameras. But uh, the, the idea is that you create a catalog, something similar to this, but obviously well done, uh, which shows all the different animals that you have in the population. And you're gonna wanna give them either numbers or names or both. And you're gonna want to have all the information of, uh, of when they were first sighted, um, who they were sighted with, where, what were they doing, all this kind of information. That's how you start your database. <laughs> And so at the moment, uh, we have, uh, let me just see if, uh, if I was going to, yeah. So at the moment, before I, I talk about our actual projects, I'm gonna introduce you to, uh, will you believe it? I've lost the page. Ah, there we go. <laughs> I'm gonna introduce you to, first I'm gonna use my drawing, to the Rissos dolphin. All right, so this is a, a species that, um, I've actually put this poster here because it's called Nuestros Cetáceos, our cetaceans. And a lot of posters that I've seen of Mediterranean sea cetaceans don't have the Rissos dolphin. They have, well, here, for example, we have the sperm whale, common dolphin. Uh, we even have the rough tooth dolphin here, which I've never seen in the Mediterranean. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, it's there instead of the Rissos dolphin. So the Rissos dolphin is a species that we don't really know that much about. So there are a few studies in the Azores, for example. There's a really nice one. Um, in Scotland, there's another one. Uh, where, where else? Let me just say, they're, they're very dotted around. But um, there are very few researchers that focus on this animal because they're very, um, they're, they're a little bit hard to study. They're a bit offshore. You don't see them really that often. Um, in some places, they, they shy away from boats a little bit, uh, according to some researchers. And so um, this is a species that really, um, any information that we can get on it, Will, will contribute to knowledge of, uh, of, of, of this animal worldwide, really. So this is the animal that we are uh, studying, and I'm gonna show you a better drawing than mine, which is here. So, a little bit on the Rissos dolphin, is that they are born uh, dark, usually dark gray, and as they age, they, uh, they get whiter, and that's because they accumulate scarring uh, over their lives, so they, in their social interactions, they will uh, scar each other with the teeth in their mouths, and those scars will accumulate uh, during their lives. And so you can see here, for example, this this one it's accumulating a lot of uh, a lot of uh, scars there, and then the the older ones actually go uh, quite white, which is very interesting. And this doesn't happen in any other dolphin species. It's it's quite unique to the Rissos dolphin. And um, not sure how I'm doing for time. And uh, we we don't know why this happens. Um, my personal, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a risk here. My personal, uh, opinion is that, um, it's, it's probably considered sexy. So, uh, so both males and females have it. Um, and, uh, there, there, there are videos, for example, that, uh, the researcher, Dr. Hartman in, in the Azores, uh, has shown us that, that shows like these kind of, um, mating ritual, uh, orgy things. Um, in which uh, the dolphins, uh, they seem to, to, to be scratching each other as a part of that. So, so that's, um, <laughs> that opens up a lot of, a lot of interesting questions. Um, so yeah, so, so, so Rissos like it rough is, uh, is, 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 definitely, um, is definitely a fact. Uh, the question, though, is, is, is why. So, you know, why, why this dolphin does things this way? I mean, maybe... Uh, maybe the scars accumulated are, are a sign of uh, an older, more mature, uh, stronger animal. I don't know. This is just my little, you know, thoughts on the um, on the issue. But the the fact of the matter is that they have scarring that accumulates, and uh, this actually is really, really interesting. Let's see if I have a photograph on my phone. It's really, really interesting for uh, our studies because 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 it means that. Even though, even though the dorsal fins are quite big, um, they also have scratches. They're quite unique. Um, it also means that that the rest of the body is is scarred as well, right? So, in case we we have an animal that doesn't have a really distinctive dorsal fin, we can take a photograph of um, the rest of the body, and we and that will help uh, us identify it. So, Rissos dolphins are are really interesting in. Um, 
in that sense, uh, because uh, even even poorer quality photographs can can tell us which individual we're looking at, uh, which is one of the reasons why we want to get um, citizen science uh, scientists involved. Let's see if I have anything else here to show. Okay, so this is an animal that I mean, even even something like this, I'll show you in in a second if it allows me. Even something like this, right? So this is this animal is underwater, and the dorsal fin is not really clear at all because it's quite young. But um, if if you really look at it, I don't think you can see it that well. But it has some some nice markings uh, around by around just under the head. And so even even those markings, if we get a photograph of this animal again, uh, we may be able to to tell which one it is. So. Let me see what's uh, what what else what else. Okay, so what do we do? As I said before, uh, we go out there into the uh, the high seas. If we see Rissos dolphins, one of our amazing volunteers will go dolphins, um, and then we will we will do this. We will get we will get our, our binoculars. We're really excited. I do need to these off. And we'll we'll have a look out. Uh, we'll try and confirm if they are Rissos dolphins or not. Um, and we'll try and get as close as possible without disturbing the uh, the animals. That's really important for us. Not just because it um, it alters their behavior, but also just because we want to be as respectful as possible to them. So, and but, but anyways, if if we can get within a certain range, uh, our our cameras are are really good. The ones we have on board. Um, and the photographs are really fantastic. And we have, a, uh, apart from that, we have some really fantastic volunteers uh, like uh, Beat, for example. I don't know if he'll watch this, but if he does, then then hi. <laughs> uh, Beat is really fantastic, and like a lot of photographs in in the catalog are are thanks to to his quick quick trigger. Um, so yeah, so so we um, I I can't really. I, because I, I haven't got a printer that works here, and you know everything's closed, and we're supposed to stay at home, so I haven't really got any uh, catalog printed. However, uh, it looks <laughs> again something like this, right? So it has all the fins, um, photographs, obviously, and it allows us to tell tell them apart. Before I continue, actually, I'm going to send you all something. No, I'll do this afterwards. Forget I said anything. Anyway, so at the moment, I'm going to put this here again so you can see our lovely users. Um, at the moment, we have in our catalog, we have uh, just over 100 animals. Um, so at the moment, we, we, we have to have, uh, because obviously when you're out at sea, you, go, you can't have, um, it's, it's very difficult to get um, uh, the left side of the fin and the right side of the fin of the same animal. So we have two different catalogs at the moment. We have left side catalogs, if that makes sense, and right side. So on the left side, we have 100 animals, and on the right side, we have 130 animals, uh, which uh, which is really interesting, but we haven't, um, I don't think we've really scratched the surface. There's probably a few hundred others, at least, around the area, so really, really exciting. Uh, let's see. What else have we seen? Let's see. So sometimes we've had uh, we've had pods of like two or three individuals. Other times we've had groups of fifty or more uh, estimated. Um, and this this is really interesting, but but uh, I I don't know how reliable group group size is uh, because um, all dolphins and whales are acoustic animals, right? So they may be even a few kilometers apart, uh, but they can keep in touch um, with 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 uh, with sound. So. So, so it may be that we're seeing two or three animals, but a few kilometers further that way, um, there's like 10 more. So so we, we kind of estimate based on what we see, but uh, that doesn't always mean that it's the full picture. Uh, these, um, the animals that we've sighted have been an average of 800 meters depth, more or less, which is what's expected. Um, Rissos dolphins, by the way, they, they feed mostly on uh, cephalopods. So that's squid and octopus. And... Uh, Actually, in the Mediterranean, it was very interesting because um, I read a study that uh, um, it it um, it showed a well. They they looked at stomach content again of stranded animals. Remember that I said that they could be interesting, and in the stomach content, uh, it showed that uh, Rissos dolphins in the Mediterranean Sea seem to like argonauts. So argonauts are those like octopus that are in like shells. Um, if you want to look it up, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to put it in the comments. Argonauta, Argo, I think it, yeah. You go. In case anyone wants to have a look at that later on, uh, that seems to be one of their main preys in the Mediterranean Sea. What else? What else? What else? What else? Okay. 
Another thing as well that's that's interesting is that about one third of pods were sighted with uh, with babies with calves, which is uh, really really nice. But um, I think summer summertime more or less is is expected. But it's good to see that they have they are they are reproducing. You know, uh, let's see. So at the moment we are kind of we're, we're just building our our catalog of individuals. Uh, at the moment, our main questions are um, how many animals are there. Uh, where are they? Um, uh, you know, do they interact with um, with uh, human activities like fisheries? All these different things because we don't really um, we don't really know too much about them. So it's really really exciting. Uh, another, another thing that we're going to look at is interactions between individuals. So again, let's go back to Julia, uh, Judith, sorry, and uh, and Ignacio. Um, so, so it'll be very interesting if, if these animals are really recognizable um, to see if if Julia is always in the same pod as Ignacio or if they were sighted just once and then they're sighted in separate pods. So, uh, for example, in bottlenose dolphins, uh, we know that they have what's called fission-fusion societies. So that means that certain individuals will split off from a pod and join another one and they'll just continually be jumping from one uh, from one group to another. Uh, but sometimes um, cetaceans, like even, even though we're studying the Balearic Island population, we may eventually realize that what we're looking at is two, three, who knows, um, different family units, right? And maybe they interact um, between each other, but maybe they don't. And so that's that's going to be really interesting to, to look at as well. But um, at the moment, we've been doing this since um, 2018. We have data from quite a few years back. Uh, but what we're working with at the moment is 28 sightings. That means 28 times that um, our research ship has encountered Risto's dolphins and that we have data on them. So there's a, there's a lot more to, to, to do. And even though it makes it look like, you know, we don't really know that much and, you know, it's kind of useless at the moment, um, it is um, in the exciting phase where we, are, um, where we are sailing towards discovery, we could say. Let's see what else. Uh, Okay, let's see, applications of this. Well, th there's a lot of things we want to do. Um, you know, so you, you may be asking, okay, this is very interesting, but what, you know, is, is this useful at all? Uh, let's see. Actually, uh, Manuel just asked a question. Do you exchange catalogs uh, for IDs with other NGOs? Okay, that's more or less what I was gonna get to at the moment. You're one step ahead of me. Um, so, uh, so yes, yeah, so this, this has a lot of applications. So in the Mediterranean Sea uh, as a whole, Risso's dolphins are classed as data deficient. So data deficient basically means uh, we have no idea. So, you know, some species are classed as vulnerable, um, some endangered, highly endangered, et cetera, et cetera. But there's this category, which is data deficient. And that means that we need to do a lot more research to be able to uh, determine whether a species is doing okay or if they need um, some kind of help. And usually that help will be um, some kind of conservation uh, actions depending on the region, depending on the species, depending on a lot of different things. So that's that's one um, thing that we're going to look at. And to do that, we're going to be collaborating with uh, a lot of different um, nonprofit organizations around the Mediterranean, but also outside it. And uh, so, and it's really exciting. We have um, people that we're going to partner with in Italy, uh, Southern France, uh, inside Spain as well. And there's, there's probably um, a research, uh, an NGO in Tunisia, which may, uh, well, with, which, which we may start doing stuff with. So we haven't um, shared our catalog yet with other people, uh, but it's something that's really imminent and it's something that we have to do as soon as possible. Um, one of the things recently at a conference that we, uh, that, that we spoke about, people who study resource dolphins, is that, um, and this is something interesting that, that, that is not published that you may, uh, you know, maybe something to have in mind for those of you who are uh, going to be on the ship this this summer, uh, and even those of you who are you know following our research, is that in southern France and Italy, they have seen a a, a sharp decline in sightings of rissos dolphins, whereas it seems like in the Balearic Islands where we are, the sightings are going up. So um, a lot. You know, one of the questions that we have is, uh, are we seeing different animals or are we say seeing someone else's animals that have just migrated right and that's really important for uh for the populations in you know let's say southern france because if we're seeing their animals then 
then it, it means that the animals have moved, not that they've become extinct in the area. And that's really, really, really important. But anyways, you know, that's just something that we're going to be looking at, uh, hopefully during this, this next year. And it's something that I think is interesting enough to share with you all. Um, what else? Okay, so locally, uh, we're going to be working with uh, with the national parks, with the uh, marine protected areas, and specifically with the National Park of Cabrera. So this is an archipelago uh, of islands um, in the south of, uh, well, south of Mallorca, which is the main island in the Balearics. Uh, and it's a, uh, it's a declared national park, and a huge part of that national park is a marine area. In, um, in, in Spain weren't protected yet. Um, one of these was obviously presence of cetaceans, sea turtles, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, they, they, they seem to be interested in, in, in our work, uh, what we're doing, because um, studying risk of dolphins is, uh, is one of the ways that we can monitor um, the health of, of, a, of an ecosystem. And uh, especially somewhere like, like this uh, national park, like Cabrera, they, they they really need all the information that they can from people like us to be able to make the let's try to, 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 to simplify to make the, the best decisions possible in how they're going to monitor and how they're going to manage um, that area. So you know what what are they going to permit um, tourist wise? Um, are ships going to be allowed to go near there or around there? All these different things. It has to be based on solid science, and that's what uh, that's what Save the Med is all about. It's on uh, not just making recommendations and uh, not just you know saying protect the the seas uh, just because. It's um, it's about getting the the information first, um, having some really solid facts about the the area, the animals, the ecosystem, everything that we can, and then based on that, making the best decision possible. So that's. Um, that's basically what what we're trying to do, and this is this is only a sub project. As I, as I said at the beginning, Save the Med does so many things, from coastal actions to beach cleans. Um, there's a really amazing turtle um, project that um, that you can look at in uh, another one of these YouTube videos. And uh, this resource dolphin is just beginning, and it's just uh, just one more little aspect in a in a bigger picture because we can't focus on just one different di different uh, components. I'd say of of the uh, of the of the oceans to be able to have a clearer picture so um let's see i don't want to go on too much i think uh i think i'm going to be told off already most likely just just to say that that this project um before I, oh, i'm gonna have a look at questions in a minute uh but just to say that this project really i mean even though i'm coordinating um i have some amazing colleagues that are really helping out so you know from from uh from uh, rick for example, uh, who is uh, who has supported this from from day one and really really motivated as well uh, to Jasmine who helps coordinate the um, expeditions and does a lot of a lot of work with me um, you know via email and and uh, and Skypes every now and again and stuff uh, to people um, like Anna Suter who's a photographer really really fantastic as well um, she does apart from photographs she. Uh, organizes like the thousands of photographs that we've taken of resource dolphins, um, crops the, the fins out, uh, and uh, does does a lot of a lot of things, uh, and just the volunteers in general. I mean, uh, when volunteers come on come on, on on our expeditions on the ship, they I, I I get the impression that they leave quite satisfied because they are contributing to real um, solid projects. And and the best thing about it in Save the Med is that they actually have um, have direct impact on ecosystems. So we don't do science just because it has to have some kind of direct uh, impact uh, on on an ecosystem, on an area, or general knowledge of the oceans. And it has to have you know positive outcomes. So let me just see. Um, I think that's more or less all I wanted to tell you. It's basically just been a, a summary of. How to, how we go about studying these animals? Uh, why I'm obsessed with dorsal fins? Um, I wanted to show you my blow up dolphin, <laughs> and uh, all these things behind me I just put there to to look good. Um, but uh, let's see, let's let's do some questions. I think I've gone over a bit, but let's try and pick a few. By the way, thank you all for coming um, and and uh, and listening to to me rambling on. This is like a, a dream talking to dolphins and people actually listening. Let's see. 
so I'm going to select a few. So Sergio uh, asked, during the lifespan of an animal, can the shape change and introduce errors in photo ID? Yes, yes, they 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 can, of course. I mean, um, so really young animals, we don't really count in in um, in our statistics uh, afterwards because young animals, you can't really differentiate one from another. Um, older animals, in Rissos dolphins, the good thing is if they have a few really, really clear scratches, um, even if they accumulate more afterwards, you can you can quite uh, you know be quite confident about about IDing them again. But yeah, I mean, uh, we have we have that's uh, that wasn't there before. So yeah, yeah, they can they can they can change. Um, but but in in your catalog, so when you have your photographs, yeah, uh, if you need to update them because you have a better photograph of an individual, then you just update it. So then you have the uh, <laughs> um, more scarring means better ID. Or better chance of confusion because the image changes. Yeah, that's more or less what we were saying before. The confusion because the image changes. Yeah, that's more or less what we were saying before. It, it, it can be tricky. It sounds easy, but it can be really tricky sometimes. And there's there's also a software that we can use. Uh, there's one called Darwin, uh, which basically does like the outline of the fin. Um, but there's also new ones that are being um, developed at the moment. Uh, there's one that we're really interested in in Italy, and it's uh, it's basically it's artificial intelligence. It it gets photographs of uh, different dorsal fins, and it kind of like you know calculates I don't know like the the uh, one scar relative to the other, and all these kind of things, and it'll give you um, like it'll suggest potential matches. So you know it'll say okay, this fin that you want to find a, a um, another photograph of, it could potentially be this one, this one, this one, this one. So there's software that can help you, and, and that's really good when you have hundreds of images or thousands of images. Uh, does little interaction mean engine shut off too? We found that changing the engine revs rather scares them off, so better keep going same speed and not uh, and not change at all. Yeah, um, this this is one more for our more for our captain. But I mean, the the idea is that is that you are, you're at a certain cruising speed, which is not. Uh, I, I'm I'm trying to think what it was at the moment, but there's I know in Spain at least there's legislation, so there's like a maximum speed. The idea is that you don't you don't change that speed. If you if you change it, you may start making too many noises and stuff. Uh, the animals um, change the behavior. Um, even if even if you, you approach them <laughs> responsibly, sometimes they just don't want to know anything, so they they head off. But but the, the, there are um, there are uh, international you know standards recommendations, and there's also legislation. And uh, Manuel, we can talk about that. Um, uh, later on, and I can see, even send you some documents on that as well. But it's really interesting that you asked because I think that even if you get worse, let's say worse information, um, I think you, I, well, I prefer to get worse information than having um, unhappy animals. About is what's the life expectancy in wild dolphins? Um, we haven't got obviously that that information because we've only been doing this for two years. But I think we have many. But you can look at their their teeth. It's one way of of finding out. Um, some projects they've been running for like 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, there's one in Australia on bottlenose dolphins, and they just they followed dolphins since they were born until they die. So, um, but also just you know bear in mind that it depends on the area as well. Like in Australia, in this this um this study site which is called Shark Bay, it's, it's called Shark Bay for a reason, and so the you know there's there's predation there from from sharks. But um, in other areas, there's probably um, there's probably uh, you know more risk from fisheries. It really depends. What's your favorite type of dolphin? Ah, oh, Jasmine. Okay, um, it's it's fast becoming the Rissos dolphin, but I think that's just pure obsession. <laughs> but uh, apart from the Rissos dolphin, I I, uh, I have uh, an ongoing uh, love relationship with the the striped dolphin, and um, and 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 that's that's just because. Um, uh, in in strandings, I've I've um, dealt with them more than any other. Uh, they're the most common. F I've I've worked with them like this, which is really really, uh, really nice. This is with the stranding network in Spain. And uh, by the way, look, I, I, I was using the mask way before uh, COVID nineteen. Um, but uh, so yeah, um, uh, striped dolphins they have a like a, a, a special place <laughs> for me. Uh, but Rissos dolphins are are fast becoming. Um, Contenders, Rissos dolphins are like the the lovers. Cuando los delfines hacen burbujas, ¿qué significa? Okay, Tupa is asking uh, when when dolphins make bubbles. What does it mean? Um, it really depends. I mean, 
in, in, in captivity, which, uh, by the way, I, I don't recommend zoos or aquariums at all, but in captivity, uh, usually they're, they're bored and they've just found a way to entertain themselves. Um, or, the, or, or the trainers have taught them that behavior or something like that. Um, in the wild, um, sometimes, I mean, it, it really depends. There are like 40 species of dolphin. Um, some, some dolphins and some whales use bubbles um, like as uh, they, they sw they'll swim around um, a ball of fish. And so the bubbles going up will create like a, like a net of bubbles and, and it'll make sure that the fish can't escape. And then they, they, they lunge from below. So sometimes it can be used as that. Other times, probably just 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 fun. Uh, there, there could be some kind of communication there, depending on you know. I think bottlenose dolphins use can can use that too. You know, if they they squirt bubbles really quickly and they 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 clamp their 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 teeth, it can be a sign of frustration. Um, it, it really depends though, because also um, even the same dolphin species, like the killer whale uh, or the bottlenose dolphin, <coughs> in different parts of the world. Uh, they have different cultures, so you know a killer whale in the Medi in well Mediterranean, in the Strait of Gibraltar, um, and a killer whale in Patagonia, and a killer whale in New Zealand. Um, they have different uh, hunting techniques because they ha um, they hunt different prey. Um, they th the social structure even varies a little bit. Um, even the behaviors on the surface. Uh, some populations they they breach more than others. So it, it really is a huge big 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 world. Anyways. How can somebody volunteer on your expedition, Judith? Okay, well, you can go to savethemed.org and you can, um, and, and, and there should be a little window there for expeditions. And uh, there's, there, you can download a, a document which explains more or less what that consists in. Uh, you can email Jasmine as well, uh, who, uh, who really is, is, is fantastic and will, will tell you more about it, anything you want to know. And uh, you you sign up to to a date. There are specific um, dates in mainly June, July, August. You know we'll we'll see what what coro what this coronavirus allows us to um, to do this summer. Hopefully, uh, hopefully, a good amount. And uh, and yeah, you sign you sign up on there, and then we see you in most likely Palma, uh, which is the main city in the Balearic Islands. You join the ship. You um, rush on to try and get the best bunk bed possible, <laughs> and uh, and yeah, then then you enjoy and have the adventure of a lifetime. <laughs> yeah, thank you, everyone. Saying thanks. Well, thank you. Whistling makes them produce bubbles. Yeah, whistling makes them produce. Yeah, well, a dolphin communication is a whole thing. I mean, I could go on for another hour, but I think they'd I think they'd cut me off if I did. <laughs> But yeah, uh, let's see. Anything else? Anything else? Whist whistling? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll actually I'll, I'll answer that quickly. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, the the bubbles obviously they come from the um, blowhole, of course, which is uh, which is basically the dolphin's nose. Just that in evolution, it it um, it slowly went back to the like top of the head. Um, and, they, and, and they have like a, a phonic, they have like lips inside their, let's, let's say inside their blowhole, and that's what creates the noise. So, uh, you know, when they do the, 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 the really stupid, um, in the, in the zoos and aquariums, when they make the dolphins sing, they make the dolphins, you know, open their mouths to make it as if they're singing, but the noise is actually coming from the, the, the blowhole. And so that, and, and so the, the, um, the blowhole, uh, it can, well, they, the, those lips can create different kinds of noises um, and actually I'm going to use this make it more interesting right let's see if I don't break it this is not a full skull it's not a full skull uh, it's part of one in three pieces so it's a, it's an Ikea dolphin skull which potentially is the wrong way around as well but anyways we only need this part for what I'm going to explain so if you look at a dolphin skull um, you see that this is a uh, this is uh so so this is where the, the brain would be inside right so this and this is towards the the, the beak but you um you notice that, that that it does this right so that's usually that's that's quite weird because when you look, when you look at a photograph of a dolphin it has um this part right so it has like a an actual um frontal frontal bit there and and that's because it has an organ that's called the melon which would go like around here 
and, and you can see the more or less the shape here of the, the, the curve more or less. And the melon is basically used to um, to direct the the sound that the phonic lips produce. So that's how the dolphins um, produce their sonar, and that's how they they can direct it towards uh, towards their prey, towards whatever they they want information on. And uh, from the, with the lower jaw, they they receive the sound. Uh, so the lower jaw kind of acts as the uh, as our outer ears. Um, dolphins with ears would look ridiculous. <laughs> so so they use their lower jaw and uh, and the information. I'm really summarizing it. The information then goes to the the brain, and they can create this mental image of what's uh, what's in front of them, and it's really effective. So basically, it's a sonar. But yeah, it's really really interesting when you look at a dolphin skull because. You you see the you see the the, the space that that organ go where, where that organ goes. So I'm gonna put this back here before, before I break it. And anyway, I think that's it. You know, I think I've I've, I've gone I've gone way over my time. Uh, I hope you've all had fun. Uh, I definitely have uh, a lot. I, I could do. Hey, I'm, I'm interested in expeditions. I'm interested in coming along and uh, helping out. Uh, I'm interested in scrubbing the ship. Um, making meals, looking for dolphins. Um, if you have, you know, sea turtles, I'll help out uh, with tagging sea turtles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah, fantastic. And I also, apart from apart from her email, I also uh, recommend you, you go on the website because Save the Med does a lot of things, and you may be interested in uh, in other activities as well. So, anyways, uh, in age. Um, the Julie about the, the the dorsal fin. I'm gonna just answer this, and that's it. Changes with age, yeah. Um, shape and size, yeah. Oh, let's see. Well, yeah, the do the dorsal fin does does change, and you can estimate, yeah, you can estimate age of individuals and risk of dolphins based on how white they are. You know, because I mentioned about scarring, and so there are different um, gradients of scarring that will kind of give you an estimate of the age. Uh, anyways, um. I'm gonna I'm gonna say say goodbye. Um, if anyone wants to um, get in touch as well, I'm gonna leave. Uh, uh, well, actually, get in touch through through Jasmine, or you can leave a comment here. I'll see it later. And also, before I sign off, before I know, you can leave a comment here. I'll see it later. And also, before I sign off, before I sign off, if you bear with me for just a second, I'm gonna I'm gonna paste a, uh, that. So I pasted a link in the comments. Let's say I've got two minutes until I hit the one hour mark. Um, and, and that basically is, is, is a WeTransfer download. So if anyone's interested in seeing an actual photograph or two of, um, of dorsal fins that we have, uh, seeing, a, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of a summary of the project on there as well. Um, I, I, just, I just made it this morning because I thought it'd be nice to leave you with uh, not well, not with homework, or like I was very tempted, um, but to leave you with some like uh, some notes, and some additional information in case anyone's um, anyone wants a bit more. So, yeah, hope you enjoyed it, and I'm going to sign off. So thanks, thanks again, everyone, and goodbye. Where is it? There.